Uh, good morning, I'm Kevin Giovanoni. I'm the Professor of Neurology at Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. And I spend most of my time doing multiple sclerosis. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had a major change in the way we deliver MS services. And this has had a dramatic impact on the relationship between us, the healthcare professional, and our patients, the people with multiple sclerosis and their families. Prior to the COVID-19, we kind of were still entrenched in our, what I call the Victorian model of medicine, where people with the disease would be coming up to our hospitals to see us face to face, and we'd have a synchronous consultation. And then we would implement a whole series of various investigations, etc., cetera, um, uh, expecting the person with the disease to be compliant with what we're telling them. There was this clear professional hierarchy and a lot of information asymmetry. In other words, we, the healthcare professional, controlled uh, the information and the knowledge. Uh, I know there has been a push away from this particular model, but I personally think the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed um, that we as a medical profession were just paying lip service to this uh, um, change in the way we practice medicine. We've rapidly moved into what I would call the Generation Z medical model, where our average young person with the disease are digital natives, uh, and the older population are not digital natives, and they're struggling to uh, adapt to the rapid service changes. Now, we're expecting our patients to become partners. Uh, we're expecting them to take some responsibility. However, we haven't prepared them um, uh, f for this role, or this new role uh, that we're expecting them to take on uh, 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 with all the changes we've implemented with the COVID-19. And I'd just like to go through some of the service changes just to highlight uh, what's happened. And this really happened over about a one to two week period. Uh, some of the services took a bit longer to implement, but it was very, very rapid. So we moved into a telemedicine um, appointment. And we now use a video portal. Now, some patients just don't have smartphones, uh, and the NHS system I'm using requires a person to have a smartphone. So then you have to rely on telephone consultations or maybe using an old um, f f format where those particular people have been disadvantaged. And I must be honest with you, the types of patients I have that do not have smartphones uh, tend to be older, um, tend to be poorer, less advantaged uh, patients. So we're creating a digital divide. Also, what happens if we need interpreters? Now, the platform I've got is allowing interpreters to come in, but it just loses the subtleties in terms of the body language that the interpreters pick up. So I'm not quite there yet with the digital platform when we have a language barrier, and a large number of our patients don't speak English. The issue around triaging patients and delaying investigations is causing a problem because um, there's no doubt that delaying uh, diagnostic pathways will have implications. And uh, I think this is causing a added anxiety with the current system. That's probably a COVID-19 issue. And once we're over the service reconfiguration, we may be able to uh, speed up the diagnostic pathways again. One of the problems I'm having is uh, relapse assessments. We're getting lots of patients phoning in with potential relapses, and it's very difficult to examine them. And so this is why we actually now set up a, a little uh, a new initiative to actually validate what I would call an online neurological examination to my fellows. Uh, it is Smets from the, the Belgium and Saul Reyes from Colombia. Uh, we've designed a, a really neat three-stage neurological examination that we can do via a smartphone video camera. And we're trying to see how it co compares. So there is going to be potentially a change in the way we assess patients for relapses. We try to avoid steroids because we think steroids uh, put people potentially at risk of severe COVID-19. And also, um, it's difficult to monitor uh, and screen patients for infections prior to starting steroids. Also, the benefits of steroids in terms of relapse treatments are really quite minimal. And I think it's time to reassess whether or not we need to uh, cut down on the use of steroids in general for treating relapses. It's been a catastrophe in terms of clinical trials. We've had to halt all trials. Um, where we can, we've had to put people into remote follow-up or remote participation, which is not ideal. And we've had to use uh, verbal consent processes or email uh, contact. I spent a large amount of my time uh, creating online resources to try and educate patients. Uh, this is the uh, idea of helping our uh, MS nursing staff 
instead of them having to repeat questions, we've created this uh, online resource to try and deal with their questions. I think it's been successful because um, a lot of people have uh, visited the website and uh, we, we're still getting a trickle of questions coming in. One of the things we require people with MS to do for us is to self-manage uh, and to self-monitor. Now, unless they used to these concepts of self-managing and self-monitoring, it's very difficult for us to just throw this responsibility on individuals with the disease. So we are going to have to create uh, new training programs, potentially online training programs to try and help our patients uh, come to terms with this issue of self-management and self-monitoring. Other service changes is we've had to um, move our infusion unit into a cold area to protect the staff and the patients from being exposed to other patients with COVID-19. We've delayed certain or, uh, infusions or reduced infusions. For example, <clears throat> we've now extended all our natalizumab or Tysabri infusions to six weekly. Um, we're also pushing the infusions into a shorter period of time, not only for natalizumab, but also for drugs like ocrelizumab as well. And we've also uh, implemented a home delivery service for uh, prescriptions, mm -hmm. for therapies, and uh, for some of the pharmacovigilance, in other words, the monitoring of the bloods, we've actually set up a home phlebotomy service. So all these changes literally happened in weeks, and we expect the person with the disease uh, just to fall in line. Uh, and what's highlighted it is this concept of prehabilitation. So I'm trying to get my patients to understand that the risks of getting COVID-19 and severe COVID-19 and dying from it um, uh, um, are related not so much to having MS or being on disease-modifying treatments, but due to the other factors that have been identified in the general population of increasing your risks. <clears throat> and it's important that some of these are potentially modifiable uh, in terms of self-management. And I've just highlighted these uh, in black here to explain to people with the disease, this is in your control. <clears throat> so when it comes to mental health, um, there's lots of online uh, cognitive behavioral therapy courses or mindfulness that people with MS can do. <clears throat> More advanced um, uh, multiple sclerosis patients, particularly those that are uh, wheelchair bound or have swallowing or speech problems, they are at high risk. They need to probably take extra care in terms of shielding to prevent themselves getting infected. There's potentially evidence that low vitamin D levels increase the severity of COVID-19. So we're trying to encourage our patients to get outdoors, expose themselves to sunshine, improve their diets, maybe go into vitamin D supplements. Uh, and obviously there is some advice that have come out from national organizations and actually international organizations on what to do in terms of your disease modifying treatments. Um, we don't necessarily agree with all of that. Uh, and this has created a little bit of confusion amongst patients in the, in the sense that I think the advice around shielding has been excessive, <clears throat> but some patients just have uh, taken on themselves to uh, self-isolate, and I think it's not good for them because it has impacts on mental health. Then the issue around what can you do about comorbidities uh, and other diseases that increase your risk of severe COVID-19. And uh, because general practice practices have uh, closed down essentially for face-to-face -face consultation. We're trying to encourage people with the disease uh, to have their blood pressures checked, to check their glucose uh, sugar levels. If they are smoking, to stop smoking and potentially get onto nicotine replacement therapy. <clears throat> Obviously optimize other uh, comorbidities like asthma or other lung diseases. And if they are overweight, uh, we're trying to encourage them to use this opportunity during the uh, lockdown to lose weight. Um, um, and deconditioning is another issue. There's, in other words, being unfit and can we get our patients to exercise? Now, all these topics, um, what I call the prehabilitation, preparing yourself, uh, optimizing your general health to deal with it, take time. And I just do not have the opportunity to get this across in uh, my um, uh, telemedicine consultations. So, Although we've got all these grand visions, the current system is really a poor ad adaptation of a Victorian model into a Generation Z model uh, without thinking it through. And I think we need to take a step back because a lot of these service changes that have happened with COVID-19 are going to be expected to continue because when we reopen up our hospitals and our outpatients and our infusion unit, we're expecting social distancing to be still in place. So we're going to have to probably have a hybrid model where the majority of our patients will continue to be followed up using a telemedicine uh, approach 
uh, with a small number, maybe one in five, where it's necessary for a physical examination or an infusion and to come up for face-to-face -face consultations. So I actually think we need to just step back. What do we want to take forward uh, and what is required to prepare not only the healthcare professional and the health service, but the individual with the disease for the new, the new um, service model that we're going to put, put in place. And, um, you know, I've been doing telemedicine clinics now for uh, a few months and I'm getting more and more dissatisfied uh, with them. Um, probably because I'm anticipating that they're going to stop and I'm going to go back to the old system, but they're not. Uh, and so therefore we're going to have to optimize them and make them work like uh, clockwork and be um, efficient, not only efficient, but also add value. Okay. I would, I'd want this new service model uh, to be equitable. So how do we deal with patients who can't engage with the telemedicine portal? So equity is really, really important. Uh, and we live in a part of London where there's a massive inequality and poverty. And how do we address that? Also, they should also um, improve outcomes. They should also reduce health utilization and improve quality of life. You know, I don't know how satisfied my patients are with the, the current status quo. I assume some of them are very happy. They don't have to travel in from miles away and they get what they want out of a short consultation. But the others are going to be extremely dissatisfied and they're going to be very anxious about their MS not being managed appropriately or diagnosed quickly enough and they're not getting the right treatment. So I'd like to step back and ask for your help and suggestions because you've been part of the service now for three or four months and say, what can be done to improve the service? What would you like to see uh, being done? Uh, and I'm thinking about launching a, uh, um, at least an online uh, training course, not only for healthcare professionals, but for people with chronic diseases like multiple sclerosis to prepare them uh, in their new role as self-managers of their own disease and how to self-monitor uh, and to engage with our telemedicine uh, offering in a much more rewarding and satisfying way. So please, if you have any suggestions, you can either email us or post comments on the blog and I'll try and collate them and take this forward in some sensible way. Thank you.